This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andy Minter. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book Three, Chapter Five The Wood Sawyer. One year and three months. During all that time, Lucy was never sure from hour to hour but that the guillotine would strike off her husband's head next day. Every day, through stony streets, the tumbrils now jolted heavily, filled with condemned. Lovely girls, bright women, brown haired, black haired, and grey, youths, stalwart men and old, gentle born and peasant born, all red wine for la guillotine, all daily brought into light from the dark cellars of the loathsome prisons, and carried to her through the streets to slake her devouring thirst. Liberty, equality, fraternity, or death. The last, much the easiest to bestow, O Guillotine. If the suddenness of her calamity and the whirling wheels of the time had stunned the doctor's daughter into awaiting the result in idle despair, it would but have been with her as it was with many. But from the hour when she had taken the white head to her fresh young bosom in the garret of St. Antoine, she had been true to her duties. She was truest to them in the season of trial, as all the quietly loyal and good will always be. As soon as they were established in their new residence, and her father had entered on the routine of his avocations, she arranged the little household as exactly as if her husband had been there. Everything had its appointed place and its appointed time. Little Lucy, she taught, as regularly as if they had all been united in their English home. The slight devices with which she cheated herself into the show of a belief that they would soon be reunited, the little preparations for his speedy return, the setting aside of his chair and of his books, these and the solemn prayer at night for one dear prisoner especially, among the many unhappy souls in prison and the shadow of death, were almost the only outspoken reliefs of her heavy mind. She did not greatly alter in appearance. The plain dark dresses, akin to mourning dresses, which she and her child wore, were as neat and as well attended to as the brighter clothes of happy days. She lost her colour, and the old and intent expression was a constant, not an occasional, thing. Otherwise she remained very pretty and comely. Sometimes at night, on kissing her father, she would burst into the grief she had repressed all day, and would say that her sole reliance under heaven was on him. He always resolutely answered, "'Nothing can happen to him without my knowledge, and I know that I can save him, Lucy.' They had not made the round of their changed life many weeks, when her father said to her, on coming home one evening, "'My dear, there is an upper window in the prison, to which Charles can sometimes gain access at three in the afternoon. When he can get to it, which depends on many uncertainties and incidents, he might see you in the street, he thinks, if you stood in a certain place that I can show you. But you will not be able to see him, my poor child, and even if you could, it would be unsafe for you to make a sign of recognition.' "'Oh, show me the place, my father, and I will go there every day.' From that time, in all weathers, she waited there two hours. As the clock struck two, she was there, and at four she turned resignedly away. When it was not too wet or inclement for her child to be with her, they went together. At other times she was alone, but she never missed a single day. It was the dark and dirty corner of a small winding street. The hovel of a cutter of wood into lengths for burning was the only house at that end, 
All else was wall. On the third day of her being there, he noticed her. "'Good day, citizeness. "'Good day, citizen.' This mode of address was now prescribed by decree. It had been established voluntarily some time ago among the more thorough patriots, but was now law for everybody. "'Walking here again, citizeness?' "'You see me, citizen.' The wood sawyer, who was a little man with the redundancy of gesture, he had once been a mender of roads, cast a glance at the prison, pointed at the prison, and, putting his ten fingers before his face to represent bars, peeped through them jocosely. "'Wood is not my business,' said he, and went on sawing his wood. Next day he was looking out for her, and accosted her the moment she appeared. "'What?' "'Walking here again, citizeness?' "'Yes, citizen.' "'Oh, a child, too?' "'Your mother, is it not, my little citizeness?' "'Do I say yes, mamma? whispered little Lucy, drawing close to her. "'Yes, dearest.' "'Yes, citizen.' "'Ah, oh, but it's not my business. My work is my business. See, my son, I call him my little guillotine.' "'La, la, 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 and off his head comes.' The billet fell as he spoke, and he threw it into a basket. "'I'll call myself the Samson of the firewood guillotine. "'See here again. Lou, 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 and off her yet comes.' "'Now, child, tickle, tickle, pickle, pickle, and off its head comes, all the family.' Lucy shuddered, as he threw two more billets into his basket. But it was impossible to be there while the wood-sawyer was at work, and not be in his sight. Thenceforth, to secure his good will, she always spoke to him first, and often gave him drink-money, which he readily received. He was an inquisitive fellow, and sometimes, when she had quite forgotten him in gazing at the prison roof and grates, and in lifting her heart up to her husband, she would come to herself to find him looking at her, with his knee on his bench, and his saw stopped in its work. "'But it's not my business,' he would generally say on those times, and would briskly fall to his sawing again. In all weathers, in the snow and frost of winter, in the bitter winds of spring, in the hot sunshine of summer, in the rains of autumn— and again in the snow and frost of winter, Lucy passed two hours of every day at this place, and every day on leaving it she kissed the prison wall. Her husband saw her, so she learnt from her father. It might be once in five or six times, it might be twice or thrice running, it might be not for a week or a fortnight together. It was enough that he could and did see her when the chances served and on that possibility she would have waited out the day seven days a week. These occupations brought her round to the December month, wherein her father walked among the terrors with a steady head. On a lightly snowing afternoon she arrived at the usual corner. It was a day of some wild rejoicing and a festival. She had seen the houses as she came along, decorated with little pikes, and with little red caps stuck upon them, also with tricoloured ribbons, also with the standard inscription. Tricoloured letters were the favourite. Republic one and indivisible. Liberty, equality, fraternity, or death. The miserable shop of the wood-sawyer was so small that its whole surface furnished very indifferent space for this legend. He had got somebody to scrawl it up for him, however, who had squeezed death in with most inappropriate difficulty. On his housetop he displayed pike and cap, as a good citizen must, and in a window he had stationed his saw, inscribed as his little Sainte Guillotine, for the great sharp female was by that time popularly canonised. His shop was shut, and he was not there, which was a relief to Lucy, and left her quite alone. But he was not far off, 
for presently she heard a troubled movement and a shouting coming along which filled her with fear. A moment afterwards, and a throng of people came pouring round the corner by the prison wall, in the midst of whom was the wood sawyer, hand in hand with the vengeance. There could not be fewer than five hundred people, and they were dancing like five thousand demons. There was no other music than their own singing. They danced to the popular revolution song, keeping a ferocious time that was like a gnashing of teeth in unison. Men and women danced together, women danced together, men danced together, as Hazard had brought them together. At first they were a mere storm of coarse red caps and coarse woollen rags. But as they filled the place and stopped to dance about Lucy, some ghastly apparition of a dance figure gone raving mad arose among them. They advanced, retreated, struck at one another's hands, clutched at one another's heads, spun round alone, caught one another, and spun round in pairs, until many of them dropped. While those were down, the rest linked hand in hand, and all spun round together. Then the ring broke, and in separate rings of two and four they turned and turned, until they all stopped at once, began again, struck, clutched, and tore, and then reversed the spin, and all spun round another way. Suddenly they stopped again, paused, struck out the time afresh, formed into lines the width of the public way, and with their heads low down and their hands high up, swooped, screaming off. No fight could have been half so terrible as this dance. It was so emphatically a fallen sport, a something once innocent delivered over to all devilry, a healthy pastime changed into a means of angering the blood, bewildering the senses, and stealing the heart. Such grace as was visible in it made it the uglier, showing how warped and perverted all things good by nature were become. The maidenly bosom bared to this, the pretty, almost child's head thus distracted, the delicate foot mincing in this slough of blood and dirt, were types of the disjointed time. This was the Carmagnole, as it passed, leaving Lucy frightened and bewildered in the doorway of the wood sawyer's house, the feathery snow fell as quietly and lay as white and soft as if it had never been. Oh, my father! For he stood before her when she lifted up the eyes she had momentarily darkened with her hand. Such a cruel, bad sight! I know, my dear, I know, I have seen it many times. Don't be frightened. Not one of them would harm you. I am not frightened for myself, my father. But when I think of my husband, and the mercies of these people— We will set him above their mercies very soon. I left him climbing to the window, and I came to tell you. There is no one here to see. You may kiss your hand towards that highest shelving roof— I do so, father, and I send him my soul with it. You cannot see him, my poor dear. No, father, said Lucy, yearning and weeping as she kissed her hand. No. A footstep in the snow. Madame Defarge. I salute you, citizeness, from the doctor. I salute you, citizen. This in passing, nothing more. Madame Defarge gone, like a shadow over the white road. Give me your arm, my love. Pass from here with an air of cheerfulness and courage, for his sake. That was well done. They had left the spot. It shall not be in vain. Charles is summoned for to-morrow. For to-morrow? There is no time to lose. I am well prepared, but there are precautions to be taken— that could not be taken until he was actually summoned before the tribunal. He has not received the notice yet, but I know that he will presently be summoned for to-morrow, and removed to the conciergerie. I have timely information. You're not afraid? She could scarcely answer. I trust in you. Do so, implicitly. Your suspense is nearly ended, my darling. He shall be restored to you within a few hours. I have encompassed him with every protection. I must see Lorry. He stopped. There was a heavy lumbering of wheels within hearing. 
They both knew too well what it meant. One, two, three. Three tumbrils faring away with their dread loads over the hushing snow. I must see Lorry, the doctor repeated, turning her another way. The staunch old gentleman was still in his trust, had never left it. He and his books were in frequent requisition as to property confiscated and made national. What he could save for the owners, he saved. No better man living to hold fast by what Telson's had in keeping, and to hold his peace. A murky red and yellow sky, and a rising mist from the Seine, denoted the approach of darkness. It was almost dark when they arrived at the bank. The stately residence of Monseigneur was altogether blighted and deserted. Above a heap of dust and ashes in the court ran the letters, National Property, the Republic One and Indivisible, Liberty, Equality, Fraternity, or Death. Who could that be with Mr. Lorry, the owner of the riding coat upon the chair, who must not be seen? From whom, newly arrived, did he come out, agitated and surprised, to take his favourite in his arms? To whom did he appear to repeat her faltering words, when, raising his voice and turning his head towards the door of the room from which he had issued, he said, "'Removed to the conciergerie, and summoned for to-morrow?' End of Book Three, Chapter Five